come away and come and settle down in the presence of the one who longs for your company. Come away in and coory in, in the arms of the one who loves to have you near. Come away in and be at peace. Lord Jesus, you welcome us into your arms with no expectations other than we let you hold us. Save us from feeling we have to speak or have to find the right words to tell you what you and we already know, that we are not the perfect beings you, Father, created us to be. Instead, help us to breathe in the spaces between words, allowing you to feel all we cannot yet articulate. And into those spaces, let your forgiveness expand to fill and to shape all we are and do. Make this, Lord Jesus, a new beginning. Let this moment be refreshing, renewing and inspiring. May it turn us around to see in us what you, Lord, see. People you can work with and through. These things we ask in your name, who taught your friends to pray, saying, Say this, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen.
This is the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It began as a prophet Isaiah had written. God said, I will send my messenger ahead of you to open the way for you. Someone is shouting in the desert, get the road ready for the Lord, make a straight path for him to travel. So John appeared in the desert baptizing and preaching. Turn away from your sins and be baptized, he told the people, and God will forgive your sins. Many people from the province of Judea and the city of Jerusalem went out to hear John. They confessed their sins and he baptized them in the Jordan River. John wore clothes made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. He announced to the people, the man who will come after me is much greater than I am. I'm not good enough even to bend down and untie his sandals. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so can you tell me, who do you admire? And I'm not talking romance here. Maybe think of it this way. If you could invite anyone at all, past or present, to come and have dinner with you, who would you invite? You can have a whole table full of people if that makes the choice easier for you. I imagine that most of us might need some time to think about that, especially since the choice that we'll make will say as much about us as it does about the people we'd invite. Our choice will reveal something of what matters to, to us and of what we see as important. Is it a person's personality that draws us to them? Or is it the things they do, the gifts that they have and use? Does a sense of humour help or hinder in our choice of who we invite? Or are we much more impressed by a person's knowledge or expertise? And what about those who courageously stand up for others or fight good causes? Whoa, oh, has that got you thinking? Who would you welcome round your dinner table? It is perfectly possible that whoever makes it to the top of one person's list might not even make it onto another's. But that's okay, because we are all different and we're all attracted by different qualities. It's part of the fun <laughs> of what it is to be human. But that also means, of course, that no one person will appeal to everyone. John the Baptist, however, seems to have rated pretty highly in his day. Loads of people were walking for miles just to meet him, although it is true that he too had his detractors. Not that John did what he did in order to win friends and influence people. That was not a thought that ever entered John's head. John was just John. He was one of those rare people who really and truly didn't care what other people thought. He was who he was and he did what he did and people could either listen to him or give him a wide berth. It was up to them. Perhaps that is what the people around him admired about him. But while he really doesn't seem to have cared about what other people thought, John really did care about the people themselves. He had a message that he knew every person of every age needed to hear. And he wanted to get it out there to reach as many people as possible. John saw his job as preparing the way for someone who was coming after him. Someone who wouldn't just preach as John was doing, but someone who would bring God himself to touch the earth. John's job was to get people's attention so that they would be ready to meet this God-sent individual. And he grabbed that attention, not just through the words he spoke, but by the image he projected. Image these days, though, has a bad press, doesn't it? Because we think of it, thanks to social media, as something shallow and orchestrated designed to paint a particular picture which might or might not have any bearing on reality. With John, however, what you saw 
was very much what you got. And in fact, what you saw was the message you wanted to get across. And that may be the real reason people flocked to him. One look at John and you could see what mattered to him, or rather who mattered to him. God was his world. He wasn't in the faith game for any of the trappings that might have gone with it. He simply wanted to know God, and he wanted others to know God too. And folk were not used to that, especially not when it came to their religious leaders. There were no long flowing robes for John. There was no looking for the best seat in the house or for the finest food at the table. Jesus, John, wasn't after prestige or power. He was simply a deep and refreshingly honest person with a deep and refreshingly honest passion for God and for God's people. And that's what hit a chord with folk. They arrived in their droves to hear him and to be baptised by him because John had something and they wanted it. What was it? We'll come back to that in a moment. The crowds of people who made their way out to meet John, they saw something in the man that connected with them. They saw something in John that made them think that he had what they were lacking, which sounds like a pretty strange thing to say of a man whose prized possession was a hairy shirt 
and who ate wild and free food. People, though, could see the passion in John. They could see the fire in his belly. They could feel it. It was almost tangible. They knew that the words he spoke were words he believed with all his heart. And those words were spoken with an urgency that set the hairs on the back of people's necks rising. Something big was about to happen. Something significant. Something important. Who was this person John was talking about who was coming after him? The one John didn't feel he could untie the sandals of. The people had absolutely no idea. But in the past, people like John had made such prophetic pronouncements and God had brought them about. Did that not mean that in God's hands, John's words could come true too? So what were they waiting for? Repent and be baptized and know God's forgiveness, John told everybody. Turn away from your sins. And people queued up to have John baptize them. Why? Well, because what John was offering was an alternative way of living that was going to make a difference to people right there and then, at that very moment. This wasn't pie in the sky when you die stuff that John was preaching. So many were rushing out into the wilderness to hear him because they saw in John something that could change their lives, transform their lives from that moment on. This was all about a new beginning, a fresh start, right on the very cusp of something truly immense that God was about to do. This was a breath holding moment for everyone. What on earth was going to happen next? Jings, when was the last time we felt that mix of excitement and fear and expectation, I wonder, around our faith, if ever? And yet God is the same God. So what's happened? If we were to do a John and stand on the high street and say what John said, would we see hordes of people flocking to the village to listen to us? Well, it might work. You never know. But if we really do want people to listen, then we have to make sure that we believe what we're saying and that we are living by those words ourselves. It's when we speak from the heart that we'll find others being touched. The church, though, especially within our tradition, the church has been heavy on the reminders of how awful people are. We've majored on the you are sinners stuff, while the repentance John shouted about was much more like a look, come, come and have your life reset. Come and with God's help, Find a different way of living and being. Let God carry you in a new direction. And that more positive affirmation of what God can do, rather than what we cannot, was what the people around John responded to. We live in a world where, in the main, people are perfectly aware of how unkind and inhuman humans can be to each other. People know they're far from perfect. What they're looking for is an alternative way of living that helps them to turn away from all that traps them in order to be kinder, fuller, healthier, and yes, more spiritual individuals. The Christian faith offers that in abundance. But can people see that? in the lives of those who go to church? Can they see it in your life and in mine? Advent reminds us that the God who came in Jesus comes still and will come again. We need to let that sense of anticipation and excitement seep out through every pore of our being. We need to talk about the faith we have, even about the holes in that faith so that people can see as well as hear about the difference believing in God makes to real people in real time. That 
is when the floodgates will open. Turn away from whatever holds you back and holds you down. Prepare to meet the one who can set you free to be truly yourself. And know, know that you are much loved. What a message and how many people need to hear it. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all those in every generation who have found the courage to commit to you and who have tried to live out the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and the way they have lived. We thank you too for those who have spoken words that challenge and inspire others to find you in unexpected places and saying and doing the most unexpected things. We pray for those who need to know today how close you are. We pray for those around us who today are feeling happy or sad or empty. We pray for those near in the world beyond who are facing difficulties in their lives. We think of those feeling anxious or excited, weary or upset. Continue, we pray, to watch over all who need to know how close you are and help each one to know your blessing through the company of friends and through the touch of those who love them. As we prepare for Jesus' birth, we bring you those who are adjusting to life without loved ones. We think especially of those 
for whom this will be a first Christmas without someone they've treasured. The pain goes so deep, Lord God, but your touch goes deeper still. Reach out your hand, we pray, to comfort and strengthen those who mourn. Let hope, even if it's through tears, fill their hearts. And we pray for that same touch upon the world. We think of all those places where relationships are fractured and broken, where violence is rife, where people are abused, and things like hope and peace are only a distant dream. Lord God, come again and heal this broken world, we pray. Teach us how to live, caring for one another. And where people are worrying about food bills and heating, and worrying too about buying toys for the children, help us to be sensitive, as well as ready to hold out our hands. Lord Jesus, these prayers, the spoken and unspoken, we leave with you. And we offer them in your name and for your sake. Amen.